Welcome to Kobe Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DVS Group Research. I'm Tamer Beg, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 53rd episode. Today, we are going to talk about the communication of science, something you will not associate it with markets and economies, but as we've seen in the last 15 months, as all of us have become amateur and armchair epidemiologists, this has become very important. Understanding the impact of science on our lives has not been more important than ever before. And also, independent of the COVID pandemic, I think climate change-related science and those consciousness are also super paramount in understanding their implication on markets and investment horizon. So to do that, we will talk to a person who gave up a career in biomedical research a few years ago to set up a STEM-based media company. Juliana Chan, PhD, is founder and CEO of Wildtype Media Group, which spans digital, print, custom publishing, and events. She is also involved as publisher of the Asian Scientist magazine. Previously, Juliana was an assistant professor at National University of Singapore and Nanyang Technology University. Juliana, welcome to Kopi Time. Thanks, Tema. Thank you for inviting me today. It's our pleasure. Uh, let's begin by talking about your day job, running Wild Type Media. What are you doing there? Well, Tema, you know, I always tell people that I'm an accidental media entrepreneur because I never thought I would become an entrepreneur to begin with, and neither would I be running my own media company. I mean, come on, look at the media landscape today. It's pretty volatile. Uh, in fact, I identify very much as a scientist because for the past 15 years, I had been training very intensively, actually, in the UK, Cambridge University in, in the US, in Boston, MIT. And of course, when I came back at the Agency for Science, A-Star, and at NTU to become a professor. But in 2018, I felt a very strong calling to focus on science communication, partly because of my love of writing, um, you know, the way the winds have changed, that science has been uh, has moved from the West to the East as a center of gravity. So I decided to leave academia and start my own company, which I call Wild Type Media. There's an origin story to that. And my company has two missions. One is to make Asian scientists household names, like politicians, like celebrities, and to help Asian science go global. You know, uh, Tema, that is very much why I wake up every morning. I mean, there are so many good Asian scientists, but you may not have heard of them, right? They're not as famous as, say, Lee Kuan Yew or, you know, Donald Trump. Um, but there are so many. There is uh, Shinya Yamanaka from Japan. He won a Nobel Prize for induced pluripotent stem cell research, which means that we can use skin cells to make uh, uh, skin cells and differentiate them into stem cells without needing embryos. These are people we should be writing about, talking about, instead of some of the influences that we read about on and follow on social media. So that's my job, basically. Um, and also I feel like it's a little bit of my way of showing my love for Asia. Because when you think about science, sci scientific success, you might think of it as a Western construct, you know, as a Western hegemony. And, and definitely that shouldn't be the case because today um, the number of papers and patents from China has already eclipsed the United States, you know, a couple of years ago. And we are seeing more and more innovation come out of Asia with, uh, as opposed to imitation. So in, I guess that's a, my way of saying this is what I do. It's more than a job. It's a bit of a mission and a little bit of a calling. And I can, I can tell you my job will never be done. Very interesting. So when you say that the center of gravity has moved from the west to the east and you talk about how number of publications in referee journals or patents have now mm. begun to outnumber the ones coming from the west, in which fields of science is Asia doing very well and which fields Asia is not doing well? Wow, um, everything. You're looking at all fields because this is a, it's a, it's a quantity, it's a, it's a massive um, shift. We're talking about even the funding rising, so in all areas, of course. But if you, if you want to look at targeted areas, of course, um, aging, there is a silver tsunami coming our way. So research into, say, Alzheimer's research, or even you know, the way we take care home from the hospitals to our homes, that is a big kind of research in both biomedical to physical. Um, we're talking about clean technology. So we're looking at 
uh, electric vehicles, we're looking at drones, we're looking at new battery technology. I'm very much interested, Tamer, in um, uh, cl clean meats. We're talking about not only plant-based meats, like the ones we are familiar, Impossible Burgers, Beyond. We're talking about meat that comes entirely from cell culture, shrimp, um, pork, even milk from cell culture. And uh, of course, something that is close to my heart would be even uh, quantum computing. China is shaping up to become the quantum superpower of the world. I, I would love to share more about that later. Sure, sure. Everything, really. Um, and beyond China, because I understand that you know China has centers of excellence in the state-sponsored research universities, uh, but beyond China, where else do we see a lot of dynamism? Of course, um, India. Let's talk about uh, someone I, I, I follow very actively, Kiran Mazumda Shaw. She's the founder of Biocon, which is known as a generics drugs manufacturer. Uh, she's also India's richest self-made woman. She's a billionaire. And she started her company making biosimilars. But even Biocon has shifted to doing R&D and even uh, designing new cancer therapeutics. So we're looking at Asia being now less of a contract manufacturer, you know, like a testing ground and a, a manufacturer to something that is R&D centric. And what about Japan, which, you know, 50 years ago was <clears throat> made fun of producing nothing but cheap imitation and then became a center of excellence. And today, what are the frontier technologies that the Japanese are the good at? The Japanese are doing so well in basic and of course applied, but I, I'm very focused on basic R&D, which is the, the intellectual uh, start and which upstream of all the things that we see in practical application. So I mentioned Shinya Yamanaka. He won the Nobel Prize for induced pluripotent stem cell research. Now you can test drugs on, on perhaps you can just take a, a sample from you and make some induced pluripotent stem cells and test the drugs directly for your person. So it's called precision medicine. And that will mean that we can tailor therapy, therapies for individuals. And then you have uh, Tasuku Honjo. He just won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for CAR T therapy, or otherwise known as immunotherapy. It's basically a kind of cancer therapy where we take our immune cells, train them outside against the cancer, and return them to our body. Very much like vaccination, yes, yes. where we use our own immune response to fight. COVID-19 and, and SARS-CoV virus, here we are using our own immune system to fight cancer and, and increasingly they are seeing this as a better alternative to you know, very harsh chemotherapies that cause us a lot of side effects, you know, loss of weight, loss of hair and, and, and extreme uh, discomfort. What about our backyard, Singapore? How is R&D going here? Oh my goodness, um, it's a bit, I'm a bit biased because I'm Singaporean, I work here Clearly, we are leading the pack in Southeast Asia in terms of funding. The new uh, RIE 2025 budget, uh, RIE stands for Research, Innovation, Enterprise. 2025 budget, we do this in five-year plans, has just emerged. And our budget is uh, just slightly over $20 billion over five-year Singapore dollars. And that is pretty incredible if you, if you think about it because it's grown since the past five years and we are in a pandemic. Yeah, that's promising. Um, there's a huge debate going on in the West, particularly the United States, that should they emulate China's example of picking industrial champions, yes. putting a lot of government funding in R&D? Because in the past, it's been seen that private sector with a profit motive should be doing the R&D. You don't need that much help from the government, which itself is a bit of a biased story because we know that from DARPA onward, you know, the U.S. government has funded research in the past. Mm. So in Singapore and elsewhere in Asia, is the Chinese yes. model largely being pursued, which is a government Government support, or you're beginning to see entrepreneurs and private sector people also stepping into primary research? If you're talking about where government funding is going, I would say they definitely are picking sectors. We are a small country. Um, Singapore, according to the 2018 R&D Manpower Survey, there's 35,000 researchers and engineers in Singapore, so there's not as much, as many as, as even uh, some of our neighbours. So I think some of the areas that they're focusing very actively on is, uh, we call it food security. So there is this thing called the Singapore 30 by 30, 
which means 30% of our food must be homegrown by 2030, 30 by 30. That's a very nice moniker. They're pretty good at naming these things like circuit breaker, you know, 30 by 30. Regardless, so they are sponsoring many researchers who work on food security, food innovation, food tech, clean tech. And um, they're also incentivizing some of these people to spin off and start their own companies. And you're starting to see a few of them uh, come to, to a little bit closer to commercialization. I can think of uh, Shiok Meats, uh, the two ladies, um, two scientists, Sandhya Sriram and Kai Ling. They are both uh, uh, from ASTAR and then they started their own company, Shiok Meats, focusing on clean, tech, clean meats made from uh, cell-based culture that makes uh, shrimp. And then there's also Lin Feng Ru and her co-founder Max Rai. They founded Turtle Tree Labs, which uses cell culture to make uh, milk. So the number one is food security. The other is climate change and resilience. I think there is a plan over 100 years to spend 100 billion. We're talking about 1 billion a year on uh, climate resilience. So this includes you know, finding ways to raise the level of uh, some of the places which are known to be a little bit more prone to flooding, say, in the east. Mm, another area which is definitely important will definitely be aging. So we're looking at drugs and also uh, environmental changes to support uh, older population. So I said, I think we are picking these three areas. And of course, there are well-known existing areas like artificial intelligence, machine learning that I'm not even mentioning, robotics, that are definitely underway. Right. And, and there's an element of public-private partnership, as you just pointed out, that sometimes mm. the government funds mm. even entrepreneurial activities as well. Yes, okay. So for those in the institutes and the universities, they have something called the Industry Alignment Fund, where if you're able to uh, get matching funds from industry, you get like a 50-50 co-pay. I think that's very... Uh, I, I'm not sure of the exact ratio, but there is some kind of co-pay involved. Okay. Mm. Um, tell us about the Asian Scientist magazine. Um, okay, this is something, Tema, that is very close to my heart. I call it my first baby before I had my two human babies. In 2011, when I had just defended my thesis, this was at MIT, uh, I, my thesis advisor is uh, Bob Langer, and I worked for him for four years. Of, I decided to do something like a, a little, I decided to start a blog uh, and, and create a hobby for myself, which is to write about science from Asia. The reason I did so is I decided to write about something that I'm good at and that I wanted, I felt passionate about. And in those days, 2010, 2011, there was not much of a science communication industry in this part of the world, Asia. But you would find very strong magazines like MIT Technology Review, which is a, a very high-end, uh, sophisticated magazine from MIT about industry research and Scientific American, of course. And I wanted to emulate these magazines and do something like that for Asia. So that's how I started Asian Scientist magazine. And in about 2012, I had by then maybe got a million over views and attracted the interest of uh, a local academic science publisher. They are called World Scientific Publishing. In fact, they're the largest in Asia. They have 12 offices around the world and uh, maybe 600 over employees. And they decided to invest in me in exchange for some equity. This gave me the funds to start our very first print issue. This was, I still remember, featured in the Straits Times on New Year's Day on year 2014. And the article said, scientists starts Asia's first science magazine. I thought that was a great honor. So 2014 and today is 2021. You can see I just handed you our latest print magazine. We're still in print, but we've very much shifted online given the nature of, of media consumption. And in the pandemic, you can tell that if we're not online, you're not seen or heard. You, I can't even meet you face to face. Mm. And then, of course, over the years, I've increased the number of products that I've made. Asian Scientist is the flagship magazine in print and online, but I've created two or three other products which is designed to support scientists in Asia. One of them is called the Asian Scientist Writing Prize 
because Tema, I felt that if I just hired, you know, 10 to 20 professional science journalists, I wasn't supporting my, my community. So I created Asia's richest, uh, science writing prize for amateurs. Anyone, you know, I've had people write as young as 13. That's the minimum age to 85, you know, uh, submit entries for my competition. The first prize is $5,000 in cash. Second is 3000 And then the third prize is 2000 And we, every other year, we run this competition and we get a um, few hundred entries, four or 500 submissions. Uh, okay. And then we have a youth writing prize as well. And that, that is a smaller amount, but also first, second, and third prizes, among other merit awards and book prizes. So we do it every other year with the Science Center Singapore. We are co-organizers. This is a, and then the second one that I do is called the Asian Scientist Lab Tech of the Year. I tell you why I did this, Tamer. A couple of years ago, I felt a very strong calling to support not only people at the top in science, but people at the bottom. You see, the rules are that the Nobel Prize can only be shared with by by three people, okay, and not after you you pass on. So only people who are alive. But for every Nobel laureate, there's probably like fifty people in the lab who did most of the heavy lifting. I mean, justifiably so, right? That's the boss. But they don't win awards. And if you're not a graduate student, you don't get a PhD at the end of it. You don't get a master's. So these lab technicians are the unsung heroes of science. So I create, I managed to convince um, AppCam to be my sponsor in World Scientific. And we gave out 10 prizes to uh, 10 lab techs. And then we crowned someone lab tech of the year. She was, she is actually still working at KK Hospital. This is a woman's hospital. And she had been a lab tech for 42 years when she won. 42 years as a lab tech. And then the last product that I'm very proud of is called the Asian Scientist 100. Because, Tema, you see, in my profession, I interface with lots of media people, uh, BBC, Channel News Asia, all kinds of radio stations, and they're always texting me, can you, can you, can you find me a, a male, female, old, young ethnicity, nationality, scientists in this, in this area. And then I realized they couldn't find them. And they had no clue where these scientists were. And then, of course, we've all heard of Time 100. You know, Kanye West, the Pope, Donald Trump, everyone's been on it. I said, I'll create my own. So I formed the Asian Scientist 100. Every year, we put 100 scientists on the list. They, they, te- they need to fall within a criteria, which is they must, be, they must have received a national regional or international award or, or be appointed to some very important uh, position that benefits a lot of people. And we've done it for five years. So we've had 500 names. We did a, a roundup, a white paper on those 500. But this year, in this most recent magazine, we have come to the sixth year of it. So I have 600 names of scientists. If you want to interview them, take a look at our database online. It's all there, uh, organized by year, by nationality, by field, etc. Okay, I did not know about that till we started this podcast, so I'm really impressed. And yes, I will be looking that up. I'm a scientist, you know. <laughs> I like organizing. I like you know making things available in databases. That's that's great, and it's a it's a huge public service for the entire uh, continent of Asia. Juliana, we are spoiled in the world of internet. We consume our media for free. We don't like to pay for anything. How does a science journal make money in this world? Not, not only a science journal, you're talking about all kinds of media outlets. I mean, they, they tend to fall into two buckets. The subscription model, which is becoming increasingly popular, even the New York Times is pursuing that. And then, of course, the advertising model, which we have seen to be dwindling. When In the early days, when I started this magazine in print in 2013, 2014, I would have Advertisers come to me and said, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have much money to put in your magazine. I just have 30000 I said, okay, that's fine. But those were the kinds of conversations we had. And now you couldn't even get 10% of that because all of that advertising dollar has gone to the duopoly on the internet, which is Google and Facebook. Facebook has, of course, Instagram as well. So they put the money, even $10, $20, and they can see a direct outcome. They can target Joe Target, they can do A-B testing, and most of us media outlets can't give that same uh, uh, kind of platform. So that's very difficult to challenge. And of course, you have the subscription model. A subscription model also has some of its own challenges because 
first of all, people don't quite like to pay, even if it's $5 or $10. We've started to see some newer players uh, approach this with a quite a little bit of success. We are talking about, I'm talking about Substack yeah. here, where people who write newsletters can get subscriptions for under $10 a pop. I think uh, those are fine. And those two models combined are keeping most media outlets alive, but in precarious shape, I must say, Tamer. Myself, because I don't necessarily target a B2C audience, so business to consumer audience, I target a B2B audience, business to business audience. So I'm not affected as much by numbers. I've never played a numbers game. The way I see it is um, some of the outlets like Mothership may have millions of readers a month, but I target one CEO and I believe for every 10,000 individuals, I have one CEO. So as long my magazine goes directly to your mailbox, either in a newsletter format or in print or online, whatever, that my job is done. So my advertisers are pretty happy if I can produce to them, of course, with a PDPA Act, which is, I cannot disclose exactly who gets it, but I can provide you the demographics. It, it helps that they know who I'm targeting, the demographics, and they are happy uh, to, to have me just do that without producing large numbers. So Tamer, that's pretty much how I stay alive. And my advertisers uh, also do a mix of advertise, advertisement ads and also editorial inserts. Of course, we declare that these are paid inserts. Right. So you know uh, Apple is now coming up with features which will uh, allow users to you know, opt in or opt out yes. of the uh, tracking that, say, Facebook can do, which has made Facebook very unhappy because they think that will well, not only hurt their bottom line, but their argument is it'll hurt small businesses. So do you think that as data-related issues um, become a little more restrictive instead of the wild west that we have had for the last 15, 20 years, it would play to the advantage of smaller publishers like you? You know, even Instagram is um, playing with removing the number of likes that a post gets, you know, nobody knows how many likes it gets. And other social media outlets are doing the same because they're trying to prevent that sort of, uh, uh, you know, complex where you're trying to get as many likes and, and putting provocative, uh, triggering content, even fake content. So I would say that it hurts some of the individuals, the social media influencers and companies that advertise their product based on popularity. So if you cannot track who it's going to and you cannot show that you're popular, then of course your advertisers, you know, these are fast-moving fast consumer goods, FMCG brands, would say, if I cannot track how many people are viewing it or who is viewing it, then I'm just going to go away from, from these uh, media outlets and platforms. But again, I, I, I stress that my content is so niche and so targeted that literally it is a small number of people, a select population who would be interested in consuming it to begin with. And the fact that I target them already means that as long you believe that my database is intact, I'm not affected by any of these data privacy changes or, or modifications. In fact, I actually welcome it. I really do not like being tracked. I really feel that uh, everything I put on the internet, and I, I'm, a, I'm an avid user, is, is not mine and it's you know, disseminated. But I have to make, uh, I have to do that because of the nature of my work. But I'm actually quite happy, if I may say so, Tema. Well, we'll talk about your use of social media momentarily. Um, let me ask you a provocative question. Is the future of media nonprofit? <sighs> Are you making an oblique reference <laughs> to a recent announcement by, of course, SPH divesting their media arm um, to be a nonprofit? I think there are other outlets that have. Uh, done the same in the US. Yes. Uh, I think Pointer or they own a, a, is, is also a non-profit. There's quite a number, I think Tampa Bay, I can't remember. I, I have no idea, Tamer. I, I run a, a private limited, I run a for-profit business. In fact, I wouldn't mind if my magazine was non-profit, if I had sources of funding from some journalism funds or government, because I think it would free up some of my resources to produce perhaps 
long-form content, investigative journalism, which is very expensive to produce, and yet don't quite get as much clicks as if I were to put something, you know, COVID vaccine related, which is more exciting. So yes, I, would, I, w- I wouldn't mind that. Um, in fact, may- many publishers may not mind that as well. Of course, that means you need to, to find another source of funding, and that could be government funding, uh, foundations. But, you know, it still boils down to other forms of funding, like from the public. So you probably still need to have a lot of call to action, donation. Uh, the Guardian does that quite a fair bit, asking you to donate if you like that content. I think it, it changes the dynamics. I'm not sure for the better, but I'll find out. I'll find out in Singapore soon. No, I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, dynamic and evolving world, uh, but I think also the regulations that are forthcoming with respect to social media will probably mm. also have, I'm not sure whether positive or negative, but have an impact nonetheless, and it'll cascade down through the full spectrum of publications you're included. Um, so, Juliana, you have earlier talked a little bit about some scientists in Singapore who are doing interesting work, and I noticed most of the people that you mentioned were women. So tell me a little bit about uh, women and sciences in Asia. It's a huge struggle in the West. Uh, They're trying so hard to incentivize women to be students of STEM, uh, to do research, and even in my field of economics, there is this angst among researchers that, you know, there are very few academics who are uh, female in the world of economics or tenured faculty. So set the background for us in the Asian context. Okay, so um, this is a topic also very close to my heart. Women in STEM is uh, some is a flag that I, I carry proudly. Globally, the number of people who are women, globally, the number of women in science is about 30%. And this is mirrored in Singapore. There's also about 30% of our 35,000 strong R&D workforce that is uh, female. Um, I think uh, this number changes it goes down even further when you think of certain fields. For example, in artificial intelligence, only about 22% worldwide are women. And in Singapore, I think there was a study that showed uh, 9 to 29% for fields like cloud computing, engineering, and artificial intelligence. So the, the, the short answer is it's quite low. Only 3 out of 10 researchers are women. This is, is it's not good because... A lack of representation, uh, you know, imbalance in gender leads to gender biases. So we're talking about, you know, misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis of certain diseases in women. For example, heart disease, Tema, is predominantly seen as a male disease, but women get heart disease too, and it presents very differently. We need more research on that. And you can tell probably in your field that AI is being used to give us credit scores these days, give us you know, endorse uh, who gets credit cards. I think even in hiring, they're using algorithms now to select CVs for who makes it to the interview stage. So if there are biases in in the way we approach male and female CVs and credit scores, I think it might lead to further um, uh, imbalance in the way women and men uh, uh, are represented in the professional workforce. So the way I see it is um, a lot more needs to be done. So recently, Tema, in February 11, for International Day of Women and Girls in Science, um, I did a survey with the international market research firm, YouGov. They are a British company. And we surveyed about 1,000 Singaporean residents, like the demographic we see in Singapore, on their views on STEM and also how they view STEM with regards to their children. And we found out that most of them quite appreciate their children taking up STEM careers. Of course, we live in a, in a city, in a technocracy. But we also saw some gender differences. For example, if they had a son, they would recommend their son take up careers like design and technology. So 30% uh, of them said they would prefer their boys take up design and technology careers versus 3% if they were girls. So that's a tenfold difference. Let's talk about the flip side. 27% of them said that they would recommend their daughters take up careers in literature. And then about 21% said art versus 1% if they were boys. Again, a very large discrepancy. So you can see that, you know, gender biases when it comes to STEM 
start very early in childhood development, and of course it's magnified, transmitted all the way to what they choose to study in their university stage, and also uh, what they choose to take up as a career. So Tema, I mean, I'm just going to give you some thoughts, like my, some of my own recommendations, because I often get asked it. I think, first of all, I have a job to do. Because if I say I'm a science media company, then it falls upon me to feature more women in science. Admittedly, there are fewer women at the top than they are at the junior level. So I try my best to feature as many rising scientists as I can who are women. Of course, trailblazers, the ones at the top, I try to find as many women as I can. So we need female role models. Another thing which I think you can help, Tamer, is I, I have written extensively, even in the World Economic Forum's blog, about manals. This is, a, is, the, is the disease I call manals, or which, which actually is a, is, is a made-up word. It means male-only panels. So I've written about why we cannot have manals, because it just shows to the people in the audience or whoever is watching it on YouTube that knowledge, experience, expertise lie in men, not women. We need to see women uh, speaking up and, and showing that they are experts in their domain. Uh, there are other things we can do, like training leaders to be more inclusive, having policies that promote, in my sector, hiring, promotion and tenure. But Tema, I must also emphasize that it's not just the men we need to train. You know, it's just because you have a female leader does not mean you have more inclusion and diversity. I just, just want to make that clear for all the men listening and saying, hey, you know, it's, you know, it's not fair sometimes. I, I agree. So we need to train male and female leaders to be more inclusive in hiring and supporting junior women. And of course, last but not least, um, I think there's a bigger societal problem, which is women do most of the unpaid care, labor at home. So in the pandemic, there's been a study that showed the number of papers, scientific papers from women dropped uh, significantly compared to men because they were busy looking after their children at home. They're playing teacher, mommy, everything. It's funny you mentioned that, uh, Juliana, because over the weekend I finished a chapter on a book on the pandemic. And in that chapter, I wrote precisely about this issue that even this 15 months or so of this crisis that we have had, have had a disproportionately negative impact on women. Yes. Because the moment you say school from home, who's going to help the kids in school from home? It tends to be the mom. And mm. then their human capital starts eroding because they're sort of taking care of those essential but unpaid activities. Um, you know, fully appreciate your point. But uh, tell me, in the world of, of, again, higher education and refereed journal publication, is the statistic improving? Has there been an improvement in women's representation? So, I would say it's still predominantly a male, um, uh, you know, male authorship situation. Of course, you do find females on the on the list, but they tend to be kind of. So, if you if you think of a, a lab with a three out of ten people being women, say you know, in a generic field, these three women may be very junior. They may be lab technicians, undergrads, graduate students, and postdocs. So I just want to you know, provide some context that even if you see the numbers going up, it's still what we call a leaky pipeline. Hmm. Around the ages where we start to become um, more and more senior, this is in our 30s, and where we are starting to fight for tenure, which I was, it's also the time where our biological clock starts to tick and women start to you know, get pregnant, give birth, and start to raise their children. So this becomes makes us very uncompetitive. I should know, because when I started my job as a professor, it also coincided, my first day of work was the day my maternity leave ended in my previous job. So that's how I transitioned over. And then in and then once I finally got my footing together, two years on, I had I conceived again and had my second child. So I was nowhere as competitive as I was while I was a graduate student and postdoc at MIT. I was not functioning as well as I, as I could. And given that these are the important years of our career, you will see lots of women, uh, the attrition of women to be particularly steep in those years. And then Tamer, if you just keep moving up the ladder. So, okay, I'm just talking about assistant profs. What about associate profs, full profs, chairs, deans, uh, and, and, and provosts, and chiefs of staffs, and vice presidents, and, and so on? You, you see gradually 
there to be no more women in this story. Right. It's, it's actually very sad. No, I mean, I, I, I see what you're talking about. Uh, you know, when it comes to doing work that requires one to hang around after 5 p.m., 6 p.m., a man can hang out till midnight with a bunch of other <laughs> men. Nobody will ever raise their eyebrow, but it is often, unfortunately, not the same for women. You know, you know, Teva, I, I just got to, I just got to add to that. I, I love this story because I had a friend of mine, uh, one of my colleagues, you know, just casually said, yeah, you know, I'm having a baby tomorrow at night. I just, you know, in, 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 in the office. And I said, only a man could say that. If you're having a baby tomorrow and you're a woman, you're, you're pretty much unable to, to do very much. And, and, you know, they are, they can come in and come out. Of course, more gradually, we're seeing paternity leave be implemented. Even in Singapore, one week can be shared with your spouse. I think that's a very good move in the right direction. I think some of the American tech companies are pushing for for month long, you know, multiple months of paternity leave. So that is a way of saying that we recognize that men can share a little bit of the the the, the caring for an infant. Mm. Right. Uh, I think that is an essential, but probably not sufficient even mm. then, uh, because you know you've had progressive uh, policies in large parts of Europe for decades, yes. and the improvement is only marginal. So we still have a lot more work to do in every respect, both in developing and developed countries. Um, let's move on a little bit and talk about the current juncture. Uh, mm. You mentioned a few promising technologies and yes. people winning the Nobel Prize from Japan. Um, in the... Uh, Areas of you know science and technology. What do you find most exciting, most potentially transformational? You know, I'm very fortunate, Tema, to be sitting at the frontier of what R and D is able to give us. In fact, sometimes because some of them are my own friends, so I see it even before it hits the the news or it gets invested in. Right, they raise capital. So I would say the frontier technologies in our part of the world would clearly be things like artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning. I also think um, another area would be clean technology. I'm very, very bullish about some of the companies like Neo and Xpeng in China, you know, uh, electric vehicles and batteries. I'm also very bullish about quantum computing. This is something we should watch because China is really building an unhackable internet. And uh, of course, I'm also very interested in, um, oh, that's right, pollution and how we overcome it. So there's new technologies coming out of Asia that is bio, biodegradable plastics. So that, that will help a lot of the problems that we see in Asia, which include um, being the dumping site of plastic waste of the world. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but much of the world's plastic is being dumped in Asia. And since China closed its doors to it, they've started to shift to Southeast Asia. So because in many parts of Southeast Asia, they're taking this plastic waste and, and processing it in a very hazardous and illegal way. So you get much of these leaching into our oceans and, of course, the plastic itself uh, entering the marine waterways. So I'm very bullish about biodegradable research and other forms of uh, materials that degrade in, in nature. Um, I think I want to share more about quantum computers because we should talk about the father of quantum computing. His name is Pan Tianwei, and he's from the University of Science and Technology in China. That's a university called name. And he's building the, the largest quantum network in China. He's built a 2,000 kilometer fiber optic network spanning four cities from Beijing, Shanghai, Hefei and Jinan. And he's also built uh, another satellite network linking two corners of China, one of them in Beijing and one on the border with Kazakhstan. So what he's done is he's proven that in practical application, quantum can be used to transmit information. So this concept is called quantum key distribution, QKD. And the, it uses the principles of quantum mechanics for, okay, let's say two of us represent the two satellite networks, right? we share between us a cryptographic key and it's secret. So as long we know that there is no eavesdropper messing around with our secure key, we can transmit information securely 
with, with, with complete certainty that nobody is eavesdropping. And if they can do that successfully, then we are talking about all kinds of secure networks being built uh, for, for military reasons or whatever reasons you might need that. Yeah, very provocative indeed. Um, one thing that you see in the U.S. in particular, mm. even the U.K. as well, that um, uh, scientists and the private sector work fairly hand in hand, and uh, so with the, so Johnson and Johnson or Merck will hire you know army of PhD scientists who do a lot of R and D with commercialization in mind. Do we have a comparable ecosystem in Asia? Yes. So. Um, so there are some scholarship programs that train up scientists uh, like myself for government agencies, but very much after, very quickly after they finish their service and bond period, they tend to move to industry or academia like I did. Um, so that's one way of moving to industry. And there's also what we call public-private partnerships. These are aligned funds where they work together. Um, and also there is quite a fair bit of VC funding. So many VCs... I've set up shop in Asia, and they are funding the scientists in the public sector to spin off a company. So there are many routes to, to getting this kind of uh, uh, fluid movement between industry and government sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the VCs are mostly active in Southeast Asia and Singapore elsewhere, or this is mainly a China story? Um, increasingly so in Southeast Asia. Of course, you have uh, some of the big pots going to, to some of the bigger countries like India, China, Japan, South Korea. But South, Southeast Asia is really a hotbed these days for, for seed funding all the way to, to more institutionalized uh, BCDE funding. You know, earlier when we were talking about this, I had asked you about Singapore. But what about beyond Singapore and ASEAN, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand? Do we see any promising uh, R&D type work going on? Okay, um, Singapore is still the leader in terms of funding and and quality of research emerging from, you know, because we are more organized as a city cluster of scientists. Of course, there is research taking place in the Philippines, in Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Indonesia. In fact, our list covers all of those parts of, the, of Southeast Asia. And our Asian Scientist 100 is widely reported across all their national dailies. We just released this year's list, list and we are all over the Philippines, um, Vietnamese, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesian, etc., Malaysian newspapers. But, Tema, there is still a lot more work needed to get these technologies to a stage where they can spin off and commercialize. I'm afraid that there is still uh, a little bit of a lagging situation compared to some of our uh, uh, more, uh, more northern neighbors and southern neighbors. And when you talk about VCs, do you mean Western VCs or there are also homegrown VCs in this region? Okay. Um, of course, there's the big guys. Um, we're talking about, say, Sequoia. You know, they have India, Sequoia India. We're talking about uh, some of the... But we also have government-linked uh, funds. We also have private funds like Vickers Ventures Partners. They are very much a deep tech VC. We have accelerators, so we're talking about maybe Antler, they set up shop, or Entrepreneur First. They are co-located with SG Innovate at Carpenter Street. And what they do is together with SG Innovate and some other funders, they take in some of the, the, the promising founders. They may not even have a company uh, incorporated yet, and they start to fund it. So there's a mix of accelerators and, of course, angels at a very early stage to government uh, associated capitals, sources, and then the, the, the global names that we all heard about. Right. So we've seen some spectacular examples of scientists getting not only, you know, transformational breakthroughs like the CEOs of BioNTech and so on, mm. but also become very, very wealthy. Mm. Um, are scientists trained to go the entrepreneurial route? Do they have much of a clue? I don't know how much you know about my... PhD advisor, Tema, but I worked for Bob Langer and he's the co-founder of Moderna. So we've, everyone in my, in my lab, I mean, Bob ran the biggest and probably still runs the biggest engineering lab in the world, 150 at, when I was there. We, we've always known how amazing Bob is at many companies, but now the entire world can see for themselves 
uh, what kind of drug delivery technologies that is coming out of, of, of the lab. So Bob Langer is a very good example of a scientist entrepreneur who has succeeded to commercialize their technologies just because they have access to great minds and also capital. So Tema, I would say that scientists are not very good at commercializing, which is why we have the support of you know, some agencies, VCs, and, and even uh, training programs. This is why I was very happy to be in Bob Langer's lab in MIT. He's very well known around the world for being able to commercialize because every week we were disclosing a new technology. It was very, it's unheard of, you know, maybe in, in a regular lab you disclose one technology a year. We were doing once a week. And during my time there, I had four patents with Bob and my other uh, uh, supervisor, Umid Farukzad. And now I think a couple of them are licensed to Pfizer. So I was very fortunate to be in an environment where people understood how to do entrepreneurial science. And I think Singapore is catching up because I'm seeing a lot of my, my batch and my friends starting to start companies. So I think we're getting savvier by the day. And I wouldn't, I, I would say wait five to 10 years and you will see, you will see a, maybe a, a junior Bob Langer appear in this part of the world. Oh, that would be really amazing. Mm. So the reason I know about Bob Langer and Moderna is thanks to your post on LinkedIn a year or so ago. So I want to talk about that a little bit, about your um, presence on social media mm. and the channels with which you are reaching out to the community that you want to reach out. Is it uh, going the way you have wanted it to go? Yes. In fact, I would say my sp I call it my spirit animal. You see, Tema, on social media, everyone has their spirit animal. For some people, if you're very young, it might be TikTok or Instagram. And if you're maybe a little bit older, it might be Facebook, of course. Uh, we all know Facebook. And uh, if, you're in a, if you're a professional, like yourself and mine, we work in offices, we, we interact with that community. I would say it, it very much is LinkedIn. Um, bit of a future projection for you. So you've got wild type, you've got Asian scientists. So where are you going? Hmm, caught me there. So, you know, I, I just had a strategy. My, my senior management, we call ourselves a strategy team. And we just had a, you know, all hands on deck uh, annual meeting. I confessed to everyone in, in, my, in my senior management that I'm actually really very happy right now. Despite being in a pandemic, I have LinkedIn. I, I feel I've flown to 10 countries because I have connections and, and um, friends and associates from all parts of the world. I'm very happy with my clients. They are amazing people and they love and understand what we can deliver for them as a, as a company. And I like writing about science. So Tema, I must say, I am, this is the end game. I'm very happy with what I, I, I am doing. Juliana, your work is very valuable for Singapore specifically, but also the scientific community in general. So I really, really appreciate you coming to the show and talking Thank to you. us about it. Thank you so much, Tema. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's been great. Uh, thanks to our listeners too. Copy Time was produced by Martin Tucky, Daisy Sharma, and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. All our podcasts are available on YouTube, as well as on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Have a great day. Thank you.